All right, well, hello. I was recently cleaning up my lab and I found this, which is, uh, well, if you know anything about the channel, uh, I love taking a look at kind of garbage chipsets from ages past. And this one is definitely garbage. <laughs> uh, we've got a very dirty, disgusting, uh, SIS 530 all-in-one motherboard. Uh, since it is a SIS chipset, it means we get onboard video. So we've got that right there. Um, we've also got onboard USB, which probably doesn't work. Um, we have onboard audio. The SIS 530 does, does provide audio, but an interesting thing here is we have an ESS Solo 1 for an audio chip. So this actually becomes a kind of an interesting board um, the more you look at it. We've got three PCI slots, obviously no AGP, which for the era of PC, I'm thinking of building using this. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Most importantly, though, we've got a nice old ISA slot there, just in case we want to throw in something that's a little bit more Sound Blaster compatible than the ESS. So beyond that, we've got uh, an AMD K6 of some measure. Um, let's see if we can see what this thing is. Uh, that is really dirty, is what that is. Looks like it's this orientation, and it's a K6 to 400 AFC. That's not terrible, honestly. Uh, a K6200 is a, is a pretty performant little chip for Socket 7. Um, and you might be saying, well, hey, Sys530 is Super Socket 7. Yes, but we don't have an AGP slot, um, unfortunately. And the optional dedicated VRAM for the uh, integrated graphics is not present. What we do have, though, are, of course, jumpers. We've got uh, voltage select here and front side bus select. And then here, with a little chart here, is our multiplier select. And these are interesting as well. Uh, if we take a look at that multiplier select, for example, 3.5 to 5.5x. None of the lower multipliers. That's definitely pointing towards this being a Super Socket 7 chipset. But also our voltage ranges, our available voltage ranges here, if it'll focus for me are only 2.2 and 2.4 volts. There we go. 2.2 and 2.4 volts. Uh, and we get bus speed selectors of 95 and 100 megahertz only. So that's <laughs> it's quite the interesting board. But uh, since we've got onboard video, we've got onboard audio, um, we've got a CPU in here. Really, once we clean this thing up, Conceivably, all we need to do is add a little bit of RAM and a heatsink, and this thing should just boot up. So, why don't we do that right now? I've got some isopropyl alcohol, I've got a dusting brush, and I've got some paper towel. I've also got some Q-tips back there. Um, let's give this a clean, see what happens. All right, let's go.
So with the board successfully booting and DOS installed and working, I moved on to Windows next. The SD card I was booting from had install files for Windows 95 OSR 2 on board, so I started with that. Unfortunately, Windows 95 refused to play nice. I think this was because the K6 was a bit too fast for it, or maybe it was related to the speedsys not being able to access extended memory. Either way, uh, I instead dropped a set of Windows 98 SE install files on the SD card and installed that instead. That actually worked great, until I got to the part where I tried installing drivers for the onboard video. Despite trying four different versions of the graphics drivers for the F530's integrated GPU, none of them would work after a reboot. Having built-in 3D graphics was kind of part of the appeal of this board, so I next checked on the other built-in component on the board, the ESS Solo 1 sound chip. I snagged the drivers from Phil's computer lab, installed them, rebooted, and... Voila! One especially interesting thing about the, this onboard Solo 1 that I discovered while I was testing it is that Compaq actually did their homework and integrated the Sys 530's direct DMA support into the sound chip's connections on the board, enabling full Sound Blaster compatibility, including PCM sound effects, in pure DOS. No Windows necessary. At this point, we had a completely functional DOS gaming PC and a partially functional Windows gaming PC. It just needed a working video card and it could be quite excellent. However, knowing the performance restrictions imposed by the K6 II, I reached for the card that I figured would provide the greatest amount of 3D performance. My Voodoo 3 PCI. I installed the card, installed the drivers, and ran a quick test of the expendable benchmark, and everything worked perfectly. At this point, though, it was getting to be time for my Saturday stream, and since my plans to stream first power on of my recently acquired IBM PS2 Model 80 had been dashed by 30 years of evolution of the VGA connector standard, I pressed the weird compact board into streaming service, first testing a number of PCI graphics cards on it and coming up mostly short until I hit my weird Metrox multi-display cards, the G2 Plus Dual and the G2 Plus Quad. These are still somewhat available for non-ridiculous amounts of money on eBay, so I thought I'd open with them as a demonstration of something, you know, mid-range and mostly period correct. Finally, though, I did put the voodoo in it and demoed it on stream. Now, one of my viewers asked if the board could handle a K6-3 or a K6-2+, one of the late revision sharp tooth cores with the Ondai Level 2 cache. These are quite a bit quicker than the earlier Chomper and Chomper XT variants, since accessing Level 2 cache no longer requires an expensive trip out onto the front side bus. Well, at the time, I, I didn't know, because I didn't have a complete picture of the board's voltage and multiplier selections. You, you saw the silk screens, they're not complete. So after the stream, I tore into the jumpers and ICs on the board that govern CPU clock speed and voltages. Voltage didn't matter quite as much for the K6 II+. Uh, it's rated to 2 volts, and I could get 2.2 on the board, so that was mostly fine. But multiplier was a bigger issue, because in order to run at 600 MHz, I would need to find the 2x multiplier on the board, and it only lists down to 3.5x. Fortunately, the jumpers are labeled exactly as they are in the Socket 7, or I guess Super Socket 7, spec. So it was a trivial issue of just finding those multiplier definitions on the internet and mapping them to the correct jumpers on the board. The voltages were a little bit more tricky. I had to find the voltage regulator module and, uh, and find its datasheet online, which wasn't easy, it turns out. Uh, this model's been long discontinued and replaced by a different model. Thankfully, it appears the pinouts are the same, which means the pin selections for voltages are the same. So in the end, the, the weird compact sys board ends up being a, a pretty fair, you know, Windows, early Windows 98 gaming PC. 
So what are my conclusions? I mean, this is a weird board. These cis chipsets always produce slightly strange boards, uh, especially the Socket 7 ones, which seem to... I don't know if it was because of the chipset itself. If you used the integrated graphics, you couldn't get a, an AGP slot. But they almost never seemed to include them. Uh, later revisions with you know, Socket 370 and Socket A included AGP slots, uh, even if you had onboard video on the chipset. But these earlier Socket 7 models never seemed to have it. In theory, that limits you know, your performance on the board since you don't have an AGP slot, but in reality, given the low performance of the, the whole platform, it really just limits your, your video card selection. Since, you know, no one's made an AGP graphics card for like 20 years. So my final thoughts? Eh, it's an interesting board. I have a bunch of these SIS chipsets and they're all just a little bit off. It's a fairly fairly competent example of uh, an early Windows 98 gaming PC. Socket 7, K62, uh, in, unfortunately, PCI graphics instead of AGP. Um, but, you know, if you were running a, v a Voodoo 2, it would be perfectly, a perfect example of what you'd have back then. As for using the board today, um, I know a lot of folks have a lot of love for Super Socket 7, but like there are there are better performing platforms out there, and more easily accessible better performing platforms for you know, early Windows 98, late Windows 95 gaming. Primarily, Socket 370 and Slot 1, although they're both dwindling in supply these days. I think, honestly, the most fascinating part is that you have, you know, you basically have a board where you just drop in some memory and a, and a CPU with heatsink, and you've got a completely, you know, complete DOS-compatible gaming PC. You know, the VGA doesn't require any drivers to function correctly in DOS, and, you know, the onboard Solo 1 gives you full Sound Blaster compatibility, and you've got an ISA slot if you want something more sophisticated for, for DOS gaming sound. It's an interesting board, but ultimately not particularly useful. Um, kind of kind of fun to have it in the collection. Uh, I'll just put it alongside all my other SIS boards. Um, however, what it did do was lead me down a rabbit hole of Weird OEM compact motherboards, socket 7, you know, from the mid-late 90s. And this one, I think is going to be the next one I look at. This board is the Compact Sniper, and uh, it seems to be much more readily available on eBay these days. Of course, now I've made a video mentioning it, so it's going to be, you know, hard to find again. Um, but it's an older chipset, it's 430TX, uh, and it's got, obviously, three ISA slots here at the bottom, but also this strange brown slot that looks a lot like a PCI slot. I'm pretty sure it is, but I'm going to put this in the lab and start testing it and see if this could be a, a nice jumping off point for late DOS, maybe mid Windows 95 gaming, possibly early Windows 98, but you know the fastest processor you'd be able to put in this board would be a K62 at 400 megahertz running on a 66 megahertz front side bus, so not particularly fast. Well, that'll do it for this video, and I hope you enjoyed it, had a fun time, maybe learned a few things along the way. Um, I do, again, I stream every, almost every Saturday at 4 p.m. Mountain Time, and, you know, I do have a habit of bringing out weird motherboards uh, just to test on stream. Uh, but also, there's plenty of chatting and talk about the good old times. <laughs> um, if you could be so kind, I would appreciate a like and or a subscribe if you like what I'm doing here. And if you don't, um, let me know in the comments so I know what the heck I'm doing wrong. Um, and I will catch you in the next video. Be good to yourself.